Okay, it's uh, our pleasure to have uh, Greta Panova. So she has uh, done a lot of work with uh, Christian and uh, uh, later with uh, Peter also on Kronecker and Plethysm coefficients, one of the experts in, in the subject now. Yeah, so Greta, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, whole uh, whole event and inviting me to speak here. So, uh, so I am a specialist to some extent in in the chronic air coefficients and I mean a little bit in, in platisms, uh, not so much in GCT, but uh, you actually already probably got a lot of basics on GCT. So. I will talk about the chronic air coefficients mostly and how they participate in geometric complexity theory. So what's the plan for today? So just to put us on the same page, I'm going to recall some basic representation theory of the symmetric group and the general linear group. And then I will define the main, the main, uh, uh, participants today, the main objects today, the chronic air coefficients of the symmetric group. Uh, and then I'll explain what they have to do, why, why they would be interesting to you and what they have to do with geometric complexity theory. And uh, in particular, in one of their manifestations, the permanent versus the determinant. And in the search of obstructions. And uh, so we probably know already the punchline here. There are no occurrence obstructions, so that's not going to be too much of a surprise. But uh, what I will talk about is uh, the first uh, the first approach towards proving this, which started with the positivity of chronic air coefficients of some particular chronic air coefficients, uh, and then. Uh, then I'll show you an interesting application to, to mathematics using complexity theory. So the comparison inequality between chronic and platism coefficients, which is surprising given that they don't live in the same world. And, uh, and then I will explain some more, some more recent work, um, how to go beyond uh, is something zero or non-zero and how to actually compare values, concrete values to get uh, um, multiplicity obstruction as opposed to an occurrence obstruction. And, uh, and then and that's, and at this point I should say that, so next week, Peter Birgesser will be talking about the full uh, the, the actual, the, actually the, the full proof of the fact that there are no occurrence obstructions if the permanent versus the determinant question in GCT. Um, and uh, to, today we will focus only on this first part. All right. So, so here um, we start with some very basic uh, notions from combinatorics, algebraic combinatorics and representation theory. So we have the symmetric group, which you probably know, symmetric group of permutations on n elements. And we can think of them as bijections from the set of one up to n to set of uh, one up to n. And uh, they form a group under composition. So we know how to multiply permutations and so on. And um, the other important object that's going to show up all the time in this talk, these are the integer partitions lambda. So these are sequences. We write them in this form. So this lambda one and so on up to lambda L are non-negative integers. Actually, uh, if L is going to be the length of the partition, these are going to be positive integers. And they are, lambda is a partition of N if it sums up to N. And we represent uh, partition by its Young diagram. So if lambda, for example, is 5, 3, 2, then we means that we draw five boxes on the first row, three boxes on the second row, and two boxes on the last row. And the total number of boxes is going to be n, in this case, um, 10. OK, so what are uh, group representations? 
in general, and I mean, in particular for the symmetric group, these are going to be um, uh, homomorphisms, which represent uh, the elements of SN as matrices and satisfy the group law. So, so GLV, we can think of matrices over, um, over a certain vector space. So, so everything in this talk is going to be over the complex numbers. So every polynomial is completely reducible and, uh, and so on. So we, we have no uh, uh, bad behavior in some sense. So if we take uh, the vector space uh, the, of dimension three, and then we can, for example, do the permutation representation, which is just uh, writing a permutation as the permutation matrix uh, as uh, in this example. So what does this notation mean? It means that, so we can think of this as where do does one, two, and three go? So one goes to two. So one goes to the second position, which is going to be the one here. Two goes to three. This is the third position and one goes, and three goes to the first position. And then if you compose two permutations, it's exactly matrix multiplication. So that's a very uh, on obvious representation, so to speak. And um, so representation is kind of similar to, to the integers um, can be decomposed into irreducibles. Um, so what are the irreducibles? So these are going to be the smallest possible invariant subspaces, which uh, make up our entire space under the, the particular action that we define of SN. And uh, in this case, this representation that I drew up here is not actually reducible. Irreducible, it can be decomposed into two invariant subspaces. One of them is pretty obvious. So with this permutation matrices, every row and column has exactly one one, which means that this vector E1 plus E2 plus E3 is an eigenvector and would be, it would be the same under every uh, permutation in SN. And then, and then the orthogonal space is going to be this, this, other, uh, this other space generated by these two vectors, E1 minus E2 and E2 minus E3. And these are, I mean, it's easy to, to prove in this case that they, these are irreducible. And uh, in general, we can classify the irreducible representations of SN. Uh, they are going to be indexed by integer partitions. They're called the Speck modules. S lambda, so the number of irreducible of uh, non-isomorphic irreducible representations of Sn is exactly the number of partitions of n. And uh, I'm not going to really go into details how the correspondence works, but this space here, V1 that I show, this is going to be. This is the trivial representation and is indexed by a row partition. And this is always the case. And this V2 is indexed by this other partition, 2, 1. And what's indexed, so there, <clears throat> here we live in n equals 3 world. So there is one more partition left, which is 1, 1, 1, a column. And what, uh, what, uh, what is the representation that it corresponds to? This is exactly the sign representation. So for each permutation, it has a sign, it's plus one or minus one, which is multiplicative. And the sign representation is our spec module, this guy. And it's always the row partition corresponds to the trivial and the column partition corresponds to the sign representation. All right. and. Uh, just to put some combinatorics in the picture, um, the, there is a way of uh, indexing the basis for the Specht module by these objects called standard Young tableau. So this, is, this would be assignments of the integers from one up to n into the boxes 
of this partition so that each integer shows up exactly once and they are increasing along rows and down columns. And in particular, the dimension of the representation is equal to the number of this standard Yang tableau. And for them, we have a beautiful formula, which is the hook length formula. It's F, uh, F lambda is the number of standard Yang tableau. It's also the dimension here, and it's n factorial over the product of all the hook lengths where uh, u is a box here. So, and the hook length is just the number of boxes down and to the right. So, thing right. So, in, in this sense, this is a number that's easy to calculate. And uh, unfortunately, not many things are going to be easy to calculate here. And, and we're going to move out of this business very quickly. <laughs> OK, so how do we study representations? Um, the easiest way to study representations is through their characters. So what are the characters? Just again, a quick, quick reminder. So, so if we take a particular representation, for example, this uh, S21, this is our vector space, we can take a particular permutation, let's say pi in Sn. It's, uh, it's matrix in this representation, for example, is going to be this matrix. And uh, the trace of this, uh, of this, of this matrix is going to be the character of our partition of this corresponding presentation at this part as this um, uh, permutation. And the thing is that characters are actually give us sufficient information to characterize <laughs> this uh, this this uh, representations and to uh, compute how they decompose into irreducibles. Um, how do we compute the characters so that, uh, again, we, we can move away from, uh, from the original definition and representation theory? There is a completely combinatorial rule for them that the character evaluated at the permutation of a cycle type alpha, so alpha is just some composition of n, is equal to the sum over all Murnagan Nakayama tableau of shape lambda um, with weekly increasing entries along rows and columns. And each, so it should be a border strip. So it means that entries which are equal have to occupy a continuous border strip or ribbon shape um, in this diagram. And it should be weakly increasing along rows and columns. And height is the total height of the border strip minus the number of uh, parts. So let me show you an example. So for this guy, uh, for the for the cycle type three, which means that the whole permutation is one long cycle. Um, then we we have just a border strip of type three, which means that there is just number, the numbers are just one, there are three of them, and there is only one way to do this. And we have the sign minus one. And here, similarly, we have a, so in the case of two one, so this permutation that I was uh, so sorry, so this uh, this maybe a simple transposition would do. so for example that would be um, representative and uh, and then the Murnagan Nakayama tableau gives us two border strips with opposite signs so this total sum is zero and here is a more complicated example so this is a ribbon this is a ribbon this is another ribbon and uh, they have to be weakly increasing along rows and down columns and are of this type so we can rearrange the numbers whichever way we want. So this is, it's, uh, in the end, the total sum is going to be the same. 
This is one more Nagamna Kayama tattoo of this guy. Okay, any questions so far? What is the complexity of this actually? If you were to actually write down the complexity. Uh, so, so, uh, so this is the worst possible formula from a complexity point okay. of view that you can write. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, um, and but but still so so the the question of what's the complexity of computing a character given lambda and alpha so this is uh, <clears throat> this is an object in gap p and is sharply hard to compute decide whether it is zero or not even when the input is in unary oh, okay. and this is uh, this so this is our recent result which we haven't actually written down yet oh. um but uh, but basically characters are as uh, even though they're very simple to somehow define they're as bad as this could be <laughs> okay. Uh, okay okay thanks and from then on um, the question of computing anything else with them <laughs> you cannot really hope for for much yeah but on the other hand, we can we can forget about the representation theory and just define things with characters if we want to. Okay. So, so the other the other tool that that we use in this business are the sure functions. And uh, the story here starts with the reducible polynomial representations of the general linear group, which are now infinitely many. They are indexed also by partitions. In this case, we call them weights, highest weights. Um, and this time the partitions can be of arbitrary size, but their length, the number of non-zero parts is at most n, uh, whatever is the size of the matrices in this uh, general linear group. And, um, and again, so as before, we can use characters, the traces, to study these representations. And uh, if we take a diagonal, diagonal matrix with eigenvalues x1 up to xn, or in general, uh, in the conjugacy class of matrices with eigenvalues x1 up to xn, the trace is going to be this sure function. So in some sense, by definition, so what's nice about these sure functions, they have formulas. And actually, now we have a determinantal formula. Now this is easy to compute. <laughs> Unlike the characters of the symmetric group, these, are, these guys are computationally nice. So the, there is the val determinantal formula, which gives us as lambda as a ratio of, uh, of to Vandermond like determinants. So the bottom is an actual Vandermond. And, uh, and we also have combinatorial way of uh, writing them, which shows that the sure function is actually a, a positive sum of monomials, which are indexed by what's called stand, semi standard yen tableau. And these are now um, fillings of the boxes with the elements one, two, three, so whatever many variables we have here. Uh, and the rule is that the elements should be weakly increasing along rows and strictly increasing down columns. And I've written out the entire expansion for this particular sure function here, all possible semi-standard young tableau, where the monomial is just representing the type of the tableau. So we replace each number by the corresponding variable and we multiply all of them. And uh, and now to to put things in the same the same picture, we have this uh, the symmetric group and the general linear group. They have they act commute com they have commuting action on this vector space, which then factors into irreducible representations um, corresponding to the so the Speck module and the Weil module going over all possible uh, lambda. And, uh, and there is, uh, so this correspondence carries further. There is a characteristic map, which 
which preserves orthogonality of characters and takes the character of the symmetric group into a short function. And so instead of working with these uh, characters I was showing earlier, we can actually talk about uh, representations of the symmetric group using these sure functions, which are that we see computationally nicer in some sense. Okay. So, so these are our tools and building blocks. Actually, towards the end of the talk, I will show how to show some examples of how to use these guys to, to prove something for, let's say, for the Kronecker coefficients. But before that, let's put the things into perspective uh, with our GCT goal in mind. Um, so, so let's talk about multiplicities. What do we mean by multiplicities? We mean that we take some way of constructing representations and we want to decom decompose them into irreducibles. What's the multiplicity with which a particular irreducible representation appears? Um, so the classical, uh, very classical example, one of the first uh, such, uh, well, such, such objects is uh, when we take the tensor product of two uh, vial modules or GL, general linear group irreducibles, we tensor them together. This is still going to be a GLN representation and then we can decompose it. So we know that the GLN is a reductive group. It decomposes into irreducibles. Um, and, uh, and the multiplicity with which each irreducible, which is of course indexed by a partition shows up is this, uh, this little Wood Richardson coefficient, which, I, which are denoted by C lambda mu nu. So, Lambda and mu in this case are going to be the equivalently participating partitions in the tensor product. And mu is, uh, is on top. It's going to be of size, the sum of uh, the size of lambda and the size of mu. Um, and, uh, and of course it's going to satisfy some other restrictions. What can we say about these coefficients? Well, they have a combinatorial interpretation, which, uh, which in complexity language, it means that they're, they uh, computing them is uh, in sharp P. Um, and what is this combinatorial represent, uh, interpretation? So they count um, little Wood Richardson tableau of shape, skew shape mu over mu. So this is our partition mu, the big one here. And then we take out a smaller partition mu and consider the boxes which are in the big one, but not in the small one. We fill them with, integer, with the integers of type lambda, which means that uh, if lambda, for example, is four, three, two, it means that we are going to have four ones, three twos and two threes in here they have to be strictly increasing uh, along columns and we uh, weakly increasing along rows. And then there is one more condition that the reading word should be a uh, lattice permutation. So this is another uh, kind of linear, linearish condition. But, um, but uh, this, uh, this whole interpretation puts them as integer points in some in some polytop and it's not, uh, not so hard to, to show that the number of, uh, that, uh, that this, this formula in these terms would be the sharp P. Uh, and now let's do the, the, the other um, possible uh, tensor decomposition when we take uh, symmetric group irreducible representations. Now the symmetric group is ag acting diagonally on this tensor product and it's going to factor into irreducibles. And what are these ir irreducibles? They are exactly our Kronecker coefficients, which I promised you to play a role here. 
These are the multiplicities of S n in this tensor product. Here are some examples of how this decomposition works. And in this particular case, all the Kronecker coefficients involved are going to be one. Um, and, uh, and there is also from sure vial duality, we can also think of them as uh, from the point of view of representation theory of sim, the general linear group. And uh, the other coefficients that, uh, that will show up in this business are the platism coefficients, which correspond to the composition of a representation. So we have GLN maps uh, into some uh, acts on some vector space V mu, so on the vial module, and it maps into into this, and then and then this uh, this general linear group can map into another general linear group. So we take these vector spaces to be some irreducible representations, and we can talk about this composition. And again, this is in the end when we compose these maps, we get a map of the general linear group. Now this one can also decompose into irreducibles and this is going to be our platism coefficient, lambda and then mu and mu, but the coefficients that we will care about are much simpler than that. They are just about compositions of symmetric powers. So this mu and mu would just be rows. All right. So, uh, so before I tell you how we are going to use this uh, multiplicities, let me just tell you what the state of the art is. Um, so little Richardson coefficients, uh, from the point of view of computation, we have two problems. So one is to compute the value of the little Richardson co coefficient, and the other one is to, to decide whether it's zero or strictly positive. And we already know that these are non-negative integers from the representation theory. And what do we know? Well, as I was just explaining, the little Wood Richardson rule gives us that the little Wood Richardson coefficient problem is in sharp P and uh, actually quite non-trivial that the deciding positivity is in P. And this comes, this is due to the fact that this uh, polytope that uh, this little Richardson coefficients count the, the number of integer points, this polytope is particularly nice and it is, it is, uh, it has an integer point if and only if it is empty and deciding whether a polytope is empty is a linear program in question, which is polynomial. So the Kronecker coefficient, same, same type of problem, compute the value and decide whether it's positive. And as you can imagine, this is pretty bad. This is as bad as it gets. Uh, so, so there are many ways in which we can write a formula for the Kronecker coefficient, which would put it in gap P. So a difference of two sharp P functions, of course it's gap P positive because it's not negative. And we don't really know whether this is that whether these are actually in sharp P and we have some debates on the question. And um, the positive, deciding the positivity is also NP hard also when the input is in unary. And um, we can't really hope for much here. And uh, here um, are some combinatorial, uh, uh, what the combinatorial results in this area are. They're not, uh, not so many. So one of the, one of the first, uh, things that was figured out was that the little Wood Richardson coefficients are a special case of the Kronecker coefficient when we add long first row to the partitions lambda mu and nu. Uh, but this, this is only true if this partition satisfy uh, this, this condition and then the big partitions of course have to sum up to, to the same integer for the Kronecker coefficient. So everything should be of the same size. And um, 
And what we know about formulas for computing this chronic care coefficients or combinatorial interpretations or basically ways of showing that they are in sharp P, uh, we only have this for very special cases. So one of the, the most general results is when mu is one of the partitions is a hook and the other ones are anything. So then we, we know we have a combinatorial interpretation and we know that this uh, the cron problem is in sharpie but it's not not that much um and so and so of course the question is given that we don't really know anything about this chronic coefficients how can we get any results involving them so this is what i'm going to tell you in the next uh, half an hour Okay, so any questions so far? So I'm going to change topic and go to, uh, to, to their application in geometric complexity theory. Okay, so just to put us on the same page, I was told that this, this was already covered, right? <laughs> uh, so, so, so what's the story? The story is that we want to distinguish the two computational complexity classes, or arithmetic complexity classes, VP, valence P, and valence NP. And the one, one way to distinguish them is to show that the, the, the determinant of a matrix, which is like a determinant, but only with, um, Uh, with uh, all all monomials appear um, with a positive coefficient, is not going to be it cannot be written as a polynomially sized determinant of linear entries. So this is this is how we want to distinguish VP from VNP. Here is the statement. So. Um, so of course we we have a homogenization issue, so we need to homogen homogenize the permanent when we just add an, so one of the variables and multiply to uh, by to to equalize the degrees. Um, so the determinant a x t so x is a our n squared variables and. Uh, and then we have the entries in the big matrix are just linear forms in this n squared variables. And there are two parameters that are important here, n and m. So the m is the size of the permanent, n is the size of the corresponding determinant that computes the permanent. And we want to show that n is super polynomial in m whenever this, uh, this happens. Or in the contrapositive, terms, uh, it means that the, we cannot do this, we cannot express the permanent as a polynomially sized determinant with the fine linear forms. Uh, okay, so now, now the GCT setup. Um, so we explore the symmetry. So these polynomials and these n squared variables, they have a lot of symmetry we can permute and row wise, column wise, um, the general linear group is acting because we all we care about is uh, this are these uh, fine transformations. And uh, so we can translate the whole question into whether, um, and now I've put everything together. So the coordinate ring of the orbit closure of the permanent. Uh, is or is not contained in the coordinate ring of the orbit closure of the determinant. And uh, uh, I think I need the I need a negation here. But uh, in order to show that uh, that uh, n is n is bigger than a certain uh, 
Okay, so sorry. So if this, so what we want to show is that if the if this the permanent is contained in the in the determinant, then n is going to be bigger than poly uh, for any polynomial size in m. Okay, so how do we distinguish these two coordinate rings? Well, we decompose them into irreducible representations. So these are um, the, the general linear group GLN squared on N squared variables is acting on both of these. So we can decompose into irreducible representations with respect to that. And uh, if we uh, look for, for degree D uh, regular functions in this coordinate rings and then we are restricting ourselves to partitions of size and D. So these are, but this is our grading. Uh, and, uh, and we look at the re representations. Um, so here in the, uh, in, for the determinant, it decomposes into reducibles with coefficients with multiplicities delta and for the permanent with multiplicities gamma. And, uh, and what we, what the notion of obstruction would be is going to be some, um, some partition or highest weight lambda uh, for which this multiplicity is smaller than this other multiplicity. And if this is true uh, for some n bigger than poly, than polynomial size of m, then we know that the determinant, the, the whole thing cannot be included in the whole thing in the other thing over the other side. And, and then we get separation of VP and VNP. So, so instead of working with the, with the whole, uh, with this uh, coordinate rings and try to show that they're different, one way to do this is to show that there is a difference in the representation theory that and that, uh, that we get some, some representation is showing up with smaller multiplicity in one as opposed to the other, which gives us uh, an obstruction to the containment. Okay, and now because these multiplicities are pretty complicated, <clears throat> uh, what well, the, wishful, the wishful question was if this delta is actually zero, then this is an occurrence, obstru occurrence obstruction. So this, rep uh, this representation does not show in, in the coordinate ring of the determinant. And if we show that there is such a lambda where this is zero, but this guy here, the multiplicity in the permanent is actually positive uh, for some n bigger than and um, then polynomial size of M, then we are done. So that was the uh, easier conjecture in GCT. And uh, as you probably know, this we show that this is not the case. Uh, basically everything that could show up in the permanent also shows up in the determinant with some uh, positive multiplicity. And, uh, and now I'm gonna tell you how this this all started at what it has to do with the Kronecker coefficients. Um, so what it has to do with the Kronecker coefficient is that these deltas are bounded by a Kronecker coefficient lambda rectangle rectangle. And of course, this split, this, uh, these gammas, they're actually much more complicated, but in, they are bounded by, by the platism and the platism is just, uh, uh, it's just counting the is the multiplicity in the entire space where this permanent is contained. So all polynomials in M squared homogeneous polynomials of degree M on in M squared variables. This is basically the the, the multiplicity, and this is here is the space. Uh, and uh, and that was. Uh, the wishful conjecture was that uh, we can find a zero Kronecker coefficient for which this is positive or some n bigger than poly m. And, uh, and this is even less true <laughs> in some sense. So, 
Okay, so let's go to, to the Kronecker coefficient. Um, so what we showed with Christian was that uh, we, we can't actually even improve a bound of this order. So if n, if we take a de the determinant of size bigger than 3m to the fourth, then already, already we, if we want the Kronecker coefficient to be zero, then the then the platism coefficient, well, or or which also implies this the permanent multiplicity, is also going to be zero. So we cannot prove any 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 better bound than this using using this method. Um, and also in the course of of our proof, we. We, dis we discovered that using actually computational complexity theory, that we can show an inequality between Kronecker and platism coefficients, which is not clear otherwise. Um, and here is the, the other, the more general result and the stronger result, which, which Peter is going to talk about next week, um, that uh, if we, if we forget about the Kronecker bound, but just work directly with uh, with the representation theory of the coordinate ring of the uh, orbit closure of the determinant, then we cannot show any bounds better than than that uh, and bigger than uh, to the twenty fifth for the for the determinantal complexity of the permanent and. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Greta, I have a question. Uh, so now in uh, theorem three itself, I mean, the, the, your, pay, your regard with uh, Christian, now is, is that also, I mean, uh, so 3m to the four, of course, would also be a great result. I mean, if you are able to prove something like m to the four lower bound on the determinant, ah. on the permanent, that itself would be a, because we've not, we don't have anything better than m squared by two anyway. That's a, that's a good good question, and uh, so we haven't gone in the other direction. We can only show that what we cannot prove with this method okay. so okay. far. But uh, but this is a uh, so I will uh, yeah I will, uh, now I'll, I'll I'll explain how the proof goes and and possible ways of how to actually strengthen the result to actually get this as a lower okay. bound. Okay. Uh, Yes, so the whole problem, I mean, part of the problem is of course that, uh, that we, know, we know very little about the actual multiplicities. Um, and uh, I mean, even, even, even if we, we have these crude bounds with Kronecker coefficients, we still uh, <clears throat> can't say much, but um, let me show you what we can say uh, without any formulas, how how we how we can derive these results? Um, okay, so this is the result that I'm going to talk about now. Um, if the if the Kronecker coefficient is zero, then then the multiplicity in the or in the coordinate ring orbit closure of the permanent is also zero. And um, do we you, we need two crucial facts actually the first one is the most crucial and it comes from the fact that we have this padding here so this is the padded permanent we have to we have to homogenize things in order to compare with determinants of bigger size <clears throat> and this padding somehow when we look at the uh, the representations which will show in the coordinate ring orbit closure of this padded polynomials. So it doesn't matter whether it's permanent here or some other homogeneous polynomial. This padding is giving us partition, is telling us that partitions participating here need to have a very long first row. So <clears throat> basically the body of the partition somehow corresponds to whatever shows up here in the polynomial and this padding is making the first row very well. <coughs> Sorry. And then the other, and the other argument and the other constraint is we need to have that these bigger than 
you know, the, the degree, the grading um, we have to search for has to be d bigger than n over n. Okay. So partitions with long first row and Kronecker coefficients of rectangles. So let's see what we can say. Well, it turns out that if we have a partition with long first row, we, the number of parts of the partition has to be at most m squared because we have m squared variables. <laughs> and, uh, and if, uh, and then if n is bigger than this, 3m m to the m to the fourth, then the Kronecker coefficient is always positive, except for six special cases, which we deal with separately. But anyway. <laughs> so how do we prove Kronecker positivity if we don't have formulas? Well, we know something. Um, and the idea is the following. So we have, a, we have, so I'm gonna take this partition without the first row. So all the parts afterwards, and I'm going to decompose it um, into, um, into some of uh, rectangular partitions and let me, since I have different slides and I cannot write on on all of them at the same time, so let me tell you how this is works. How this works. So we use some crucial facts. One is that this Kronecker coefficient square 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 is actually bigger than zero. It's a result of Christina Bessenroth and her student Benz. And this, uh, this can be slightly generalized and we can show a lower bound here, the value of a character, the absolute value of a character. Uh, so we can also get a, not just positive, but other lower bounds for this chronic coefficient. Um, and the other, the other thing we use is that the chronic coefficient of three partitions is the same as taking transposing two of these representations. Transposing the partition is just uh, tensoring with the sign representation. And if we do this twice, it basically is the same. And, uh, and then we, we prove positivity for, for the cases where lambda, lambdas uh, are something close to a hook. So, uh, and we use this semi-group property. So, mm -hmm. so let me now, maybe if I can write here in the white spaces. So we have our partition with a very long first row, but I mean, not that long. So, so there, is, there are some important things to notice. And it has at most M squared parts, which means we can decompose it into rectangles like this. Rectangles and then into the rectangles, we can maybe add some, some part here and then some other parts to, to the other. And now, so this is, uh, we, this is how we decompose it into rectangles and now we can uh, where can I? Let's see. So, so what we can so what we can do is we can take Kronecker coefficient of uh, a rectangle some other rectangle and some other rectangle. So or maybe the same one. If we did, if we divided them into squares, we get positivity mm -hmm. because of this semi-group property. So our Kronecker coefficient square, square, square is positive. We can add up the squares, we get positive rectangles. 
we can do the transposition. So, so now, instead of having these guys, I can actually transpose. This is still going to be positive. Um, and then if I, if I need to maybe enlarge it a little bit, so if I can add some other, uh, some other partition and maybe a little bit here and a little bit here. And, uh, and this is, this is the basic, this is the basic idea how we can deconstruct our partitions, partition into it's crucial here that we have the, the these rectangles. Uh, there are m squared, many of them, different uh, different heights, and then we can uh, decompose them, decompose the partition, and have this type of positivity. And in the end, what we what we need, what the end result is that uh, that this partition and some fat fat uh, uh, rectangle that we can we decomposed using smaller squares of some kinds uh, in order to to get this positivity, then this is still going to be positive just from using the semi-group property. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the so one way was to get the decomposition right. So what uh, and and have uh, everything in place. The other question was, what do we do when our partition has some some things that don't quite uh, fit into this rectangular approach? That uh, that some small small things missing. And uh, this was the other the other. Uh, result for po positive Kronecker coefficients. And this basically says the following. So uh, let's start with, with some partition row. And then we are going to, to add uh, one row here and one row here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what can we say about the positivity of the Kronecker coefficient g? So this guy, so this guy is actually, this is the partition that I call here rho k c. So k is, uh, k, is the, k is telling us how many boxes to put here in the first column and, and c is uh, going to give us c squared is gonna be the total number of boxes. So whatever many boxes we put on the first row. And uh, and what we what we what we proved is that if we have some uh, family of positive, so if we know that for some square with this partition and whatever we needed to add here is positive, then we can actually enlarge in any direction we can increase the square by one and uh, and uh, and add uh, anything almost to to this uh, to the first column and the first row and it's still going to be positive and this is an inductive type of argument which uses this transposition and semi group property and uh, and then we have that this this Kronecker coefficient is positive for this rectangle, and uh, and lambda lambda is this partition basically. So something that's composed from row and adding a first column and uh, a long row, a long top row. Okay, so. Um, so this is basically how the first uh, refutal of the, of the current subtractions goes. Let me show you one application that I promised. 
in the opposite direction. So, uh, so as, as we said, so we have the platism coefficient, a lambda dn, which is the multiplicity of lambda in the symmetric power of, uh, of uh, degree d of the symmetric power of degree n of the vector space. And, uh, and this uh, decomposes in GL and V representations with, uh, so we're going to be our multiplicity. And the Kronecker coefficient. So this is the SN representations. We take a square, squared and, and n by d square and by d square and then our the same partition lambda. So how do these guys compare? Um, so here is the punchline. Basically, if we take n large enough, uh, so our partition lambda is going to be rho and then a first a long first uh, rho. So if this guy goes to increases eventually the, the value of the Kronecker coefficient stabilizes and also the value of the platism coefficient stabilizes so basically after n be, being greater than or equal to the size of rho then this has the same value and this has the same value and they turn out to be related with this inequality why okay so uh, so what is lambda? Lambda is just some partition, base partition, mu and the long first row. Um, and now suppose that the Kronecker coefficient uh, is actually smaller than this platism coefficient for some lambda, for that lambda. And um, let's look at the computational complexity of degree m polynomials in m squared variable so this is this is really the vector space of this type polynomials is just the symmetric m power of uh, vector space of dimension m squared uh, so this is the ve this vector space is exactly the polynomials in m squared variables of degree m so Kaddish and Landsberg showed that uh, um, the space of the space of polynomials, when we actually, um, in, if we increase, in, if we increase the, um, <clears throat> if we are padding it with uh, with uh, n minus m variables. Uh, then this multiplicity is greater than or equal to the original multiplicity in this in the original ring, and this is just going to be the platism coefficient. So the platism coefficient, basically, by definition, is the multiplicity of of uh, mu in uh, in the in the, the orbit closure of the coordinate ring of uh, of the orbit of all these homogeneous polynomials in m squared variables of degree m. Uh, so we have also stability property, which I just uh, which I just explained. So when we are at some point, we adding adding to the first row of lambda and increasing the square doesn't actually change the value of the Kronecker coefficient. And the same thing also holds for the platism coefficient. And uh, now what does geometric complexity theory tell us? It tells us that if the multiplicity of lambda in this uh, coordinate ring orbit closure is of all these homogeneous polynomials of uh, degree m and m squared variables is greater than the Kronecker coefficient which is, as we know, is greater than or equal to the multiplicity in the uh, orbit closure of the determinant, then it means that this guy is not contained in, in this, uh, that this, the orbit closure of these polynomials 
is not containing the coordinate ring orbit closure of the determinant, which means that uh, there is some polynomial in here, which is not computable by a determinant of size n. Or in other words, the determinantal complexity of some polynomial is going to be bigger than n. Uh-huh, well, and here is the thing though. So the multiplicity of lambda, which is greater than or equal to our chronic, uh, if, uh, which is greater than or equal to the platism coefficient by kaddish landsberg which supposedly would be greater than or equal to the chronic coefficient, we can let n go to infinity because this stabilizes and this, this stabilizes, then this is going to become bigger than uh, the multipli so multiplicity in the determinant. And this means for every n, which means that this determinantal complexity for what uh, some polynomial, the maximum is going bigger than n, bigger than n. and it, it's going to infinity. But that's not true because we can upper bound every single polynomial in uh, in VM. We we can compute it with a well exponentially sized uh, determinant, but we can always we can always do this. So the determinantal complexity of all these polynomials is actually bounded above, and uh, this we reach contradiction. Uh, so, and uh, I don't know how to prove this with algebraic combinatorics. So this is a very interesting application. Okay, so, okay, so let me tell you uh, a positive side <laughs> to the story. So, so far what I was saying is that if we just look for something being zero or non-zero, we are not gonna get them. We are not gonna get occurrence obstructions, at least for the determinant versus permanent. And what do we do then? Well, we look for multiplicity obstruction. So that's not, that uh, we didn't disprove GCT, we just uh, show that it's gonna be harder. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So uh, this, this like, so the ship talks about dilated matrix multiplication in the form of this uh, polynomial. Sorry, so, I would this, so uh, Christian talks about dilated matrix multiplication polynomial. Uh, so he talks about permanent versus dilated matrix multiplication polynomial. Yes. So would this occurrence obstruction, you know, like, you know, not having occurrence obstructions, also transfer to uh, IN? Um, so we, we haven't. Uh, I, I'm not sure we we know this yet, so we haven't uh, we haven't done this because the problem is in that that uh, the uh, multiplicities in the iterated matrix multiplication are much more complicated. <laughs> so and it's uh, and it's harder it's harder to 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 prove positivity or zeroness there. <laughs> so so we have we have two sources. Uh, so first, the question is to choose the right polynomials to, to, to distinguish. And uh, we show that the determinant is just not gonna be so good because of this padding. So we have to homogenize both sides and this, um, this changes the representation theory. Uh, and, uh, and for the iterated matrix multiplication, we have the, the, this, so first of all, we cannot really take orbit. Once we take the orbit closure, it becomes quite complicated. But even, but even without that, we have some uh, we have some expression for the multiplicity in the iterated matrix multiplication, which is something quite complicated and it's very hard to analyze. Mm -hmm. But uh, and we we have a conjecture that this is going I mean this is going to fail again there so we do need to do multiplicity obstructions as opposed to occurrence obstructions. Um, yeah, and, and here having uh, I mean, uh, going back to so last week uh, in Joshua's talk, he actually talks of uh, 
the fact that uh, these are partially stable points and therefore one could potentially reason about the multiplicities not that we know how to do it uh, yeah but uh, so in fact uh, he was also pitching for the fact that yeah, actually in some sense though representing your occurrence obstructions are uh, shown by because you have this long because of this padding he believes though that i mean he in fact said it also that perhaps uh, the fact that it is partially stable you might be able to do something and it yeah. is not clear yeah whether uh, you would be able to do it in the imm world yeah 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 it's well, these are all hard <laughs> so. <laughs> well we have to i mean like so one can actually express these multiplicities using some kind of combinations of uh, little Richardson coefficients, Kronecker coefficients, and platism coefficients. So we do these guys I'm talking about now. They're they're still they're still there, and even if we change the model, just because we have all these symmetries and it's. Um, but. Uh, but then, but then the, the difficulty of the problem is transferred to, to understanding this, uh, this complicated multiplicities in terms of chronic care and platism coefficients, which we don't really understand anyway either. Um, okay, so let me just show you uh, how, how we can remedy this. And this is really a toy problem. So we, we are not going anywhere close to, to the to permanent versus determinant or permanent versus whatever other um, uh, polynomial we want. But um, uh, let's say, let's take this toy problem. So this also fits into GCT, probably Christian or others already talked about it. Basically, let's take power sum of linear forms, so K linear forms each to the nth power. So this is some kind of polynomial. And uh, and you can ask the uh, basically algebraic geometric question is when can we factor this into other, into a product of linear forms? And K, so if K is equal to two, we can always do this because we are over the complex number. So the sum of these two n powers is going to factor completely using roots of unity. So that's not interesting, but let's say k is bigger than two. When can we represent this into the product of linear forms? And if we do this with the GCT approach, how do we, uh, how do we consider this? Well, we take the orbit closure of this product of linear forms, which is actually the um, the chow ring, so, um, and, uh, and for the, for the power sums we take, well, then we need to take the orbit closure, which is going to be something different than we denote it by whatever this PS MKN. And, uh, how does the GCT reasoning work? So if, if our linear forms are products uh, of, uh, if our power sums are products of linear forms, then we'll have this containment here, uh, which will imply this uh, map of uh, uh, coordinate rings. And, uh, and this will imply this inequality between multiplicities for all and um, partitions lambda. So if we, have this, this containment of coordinate rings. And now, uh, what are these multiplicities? So, okay, the, again, the contrapositive statement is if the multiplicity the, uh, in, in one is smaller than the other. So if multiplicity of lambda in the chow ring is smaller than the power sum, then lambda is a multiplicity obstruction. And uh, if, uh, if the first thing is actually zero, then it's going to be an occurrence obstruction, just like the setup with the permanent and the determinant. And uh, what we showed is that uh, basically 
there is there is a choice of parameters for which there are no occurrence obstructions but at the same time we can always find a multiplicity obstruction so this is this is a situation where occurrence obstructions don't prove anything just like with the permanent versus determinant but but the multiplicity obstructions actually satisfy the strict inequality for some particular per partition lambda. And this one is just a three row partition where the second row is n and the, th the third row is just two. And, uh, and, this, and this multiplicity obstruction shows that uh, this is a PS here, so that the power sums are not, is not contained in uh, the chowering. So, in this case, they are going to be n plus one. So uh, we cannot represent n plus one uh, power uh, power sums. So sorry, uh, uh, the sum of n plus one powers of linear forms cannot be decomposed into linear products. So of course we can we can probably prove this with some more direct methods, but uh, this is more of a proof of concept for this multiplicity obstruction approach. Um, and we also show that we have no current obstructions here, that basically everything that, that would show up uh, will also show up in this, uh, in the orbit closure of the uh, powers of, uh, of the products of linear forms. And uh, and this uh, so the no occurrence obstruction we can just we just prove for particular values of these parameters, and it's already enough to make the point. Um, so so that's uh, okay. So this is a itself complicated statement. Let me just uh, show a little bit how how the proof goes. Um, um, again, so we we know which partition to take, and how do we know this? Well, um, we compute things using platisms, and we need some formulas here again. So we actually know <clears throat> from what maybe Peter is going to talk about next week that when we take the the sum of uh, the sum of powers of n powers of linear forms, the multiplicity here of uh, is just uh, just the the uh, the platism coefficient if k is greater than or equal to d and this this is just equivalent to saying that every polynomial can be written as a as as a particular sum of uh, powers uh, and then and then here is the here is the interesting part. So here is a platism D, symmetric power D composed with symmetric power of, of symmetric power N. Now we have another result is that for the other uh, for the other object, so the product of linear forms, <clears throat> this is bounded above by the platism with the other, with this N and D switched. <coughs> so that's it's kind of a curious asymmetry in the in the two in the two problems. And now and now it's a matter of showing the inequality that this guy is going to be bigger than this guy for some particular values of n and d. And uh, and this is what we actually prove. So this that this platism for lambda, this partition n squared minus two n two. When we take d to be just n plus one, then this platism is strictly bigger, exactly bigger by one than the other platism when we have n n plus one. And uh, and this shows a multiplicity obstruction.
Uh, but how did you guess this? Uh, how did you come to this n squared minus two n two here in this case? Was that? Uh... Um, so <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit. So why why was uh... <clears throat> uh, so so we know we know what the platisms are for a two row partition, and uh, and then they would be the same. So we wouldn't have a multiplicity abstraction. And then we com we started to compute uh, platisms for um, three rows, three row partitions. And again, uh, if if the first if the third part is one, again we have equality. And this was the first case where we got an inequality, which is, I mean, we we do some uh, computation, so actual computer com calculations, and this is also non-trivial because these are hard to to numerically get compute because of the, com the other complexity issue. Hmm. But, uh, <clears throat> but in, this, in this particular case, we could figure out this, uh, the, the general trend and then we just prove it. And um, um, yeah, so, <laughs> hmm. so let, me, let me show you what the formula looks like in general. So if we have this partition where we have First part is whatever, second part is whatever, third part is two. Uh, then, then basically we can write the platism coefficient as uh, using uh, as a, as the coefficient of q to the r plus one in this expansion of q binomial coefficient. So it's going to be some polynomial in q, and we are looking for the q to the r plus one coefficient. That is explicit polynomial. So these are Q binomial coefficients, uh, which so the Q binomial coefficient is going to be defined as uh, the product of so the Q analog of uh, A factorial divided by the Q analog of this guys so this is the q binomial coefficient and uh, we know the combinatorial interpretation for this polynomial this, this is the generating function for the number of per partitions which fit inside the a minus b times b rectangle so there is there is some combinatorics involved in order to actually get the formulas uh, some positivity results and this is, and now if we plug in con con more concrete values of R, we actually, we actually get the, this difference. Uh, so when R is smaller than N, these platism coefficients are still the same. And when R was equal to N, which is actually what we got in the end as, uh, as the first uh, multiplicity obstruction, then the difference is, is one. And uh, if R is uh, bigger than N, then uh, we can show that this is st strictly positive. And what this difference is equal to is something more complicated. Uh, and, uh, and this in particular proves the focus conjecture. So there is a big old conjecture that we have this type of inequality between platisms. So the only thing that changes here is whether, which is the inner 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 degree and the outer degree. And uh, if A is equal, greater than B, then uh, if we have the outer degree greater than the inner degree, then the platism coefficient is large. This is the focus conjecture and we, in particular, conform it actually with a strict inequality for this in this case. But in general, we don't really know how to prove this, and it's I mean, we already see how this uh, this is showing up in in the study for for in the search for multiplicity abstractions. And uh, yeah, so what we prove is that the focus conjecture holds for. Uh, this particular partitions. And uh, so now I'm kind of out of time. So 
going to end here, but if you have more questions, then we can do some computation. <laughs>